my name is Esteban Mauto. I happen to be the Corporate Communications Manager here at Fidelity Bank. We are talking about entrepreneurship in Ghana this morning. I'm privileged to have here with me a young lady who's one of our promising young entrepreneurs in the country. Well, I'll let you introduce yourself. My name is Nyami Shiraba Iravna Ajaman. Wow, very it's, Ghanaian. It's a full sentence. Um, and I am co-founder and CEO of Wear Ghana. At Wear Ghana, we are using the business of fashion to celebrate African excellence, inspire the next generation of African entrepreneurs and create opportunities for women. Um, and we do this by making fabulous fashion products that allow people to express, reconnect with, explore their African identity. And I'm really excited to be here at Fidelity, one of Ghana's biggest success stories in entrepreneurship during Ghana Month. Thanks for the opportunity. And it's a pleasure to have you. I've seen some of your outfits and I must say you're doing a great job. Thank you. Do you own one? Um, <laughs> I will own one after this, yeah, this podcast, we'll, definitely. We'll, we'll fix that. <laughs> we'll fix that today. Yeah, yeah so um, at Fidelity, you know, we're also big on entrepreneurship. And as a matter of fact, um, one of our flagship entrepreneurship initiatives, the FYEF, seeks to provide financial and non-financial um, benefits and assistance to the um, creme de la creme of our young entrepreneurs. And I'm glad to say that Irab Nai here is also a beneficiary of the FYEF. We'll talk about that later. But let's zoom straight into the discussion for today. We're talking about entrepreneurship in Ghana. We know that the private sector is very critical for the economy of Ghana. And you are one of uh, the young people who has been bold enough to <laughs> zoom into the world of entrepreneurship. So tell us um, briefly about your story. What motivated you to well, unlike some of us, not go look for a white collar job, but decide to start out something on your own. Um, so I'll try to make this brief. I did my national service with New York University Study Abroad site here in Ghana. Okay. Um, and what that means is that every three months or so, I'd be interacting with students who had come from around the world. And one of the things that struck me was how by the time they were leaving, they would have two things in their bags clothing made here and our music. And it made me start wondering why Ghanaian fashion, African fashion, wasn't big here if it, there was global interest. I went on from there to going to uh, work with a financial institution, but that seed had been sown. And so four years down the line, I made the leap together with my best friend who became my co-founder, who had worked in telco, gone to fashion school. So we came together November 15th, 2013 and launched the Wear Ghana brand. Um, for us, it was the promise of the potential of the fashion industry and what it could do for the Ghanaian economy, what it could do for the African economy. And what excites us about the industry that we are in is that it addresses some of the things that we are really passionate about. We are Pan-African. Mm -hmm. We believe in the future of the continents. We believe in the history as well. That often doesn't get told. And fashion gives us a very tangible vehicle to showcase African excellence. When someone walks into a room, the way they are dressed, it speaks volumes about who they are. And then when we look at the economics of it all, fashion is a three trillion dollar industry. So it's wow, huge. Wow, did you say three trillion? Yes. Wow. It's huge. Wow. And for us, some of the questions we ask ourselves is, Ghanaians are fashionable people. Africans are fashionable. Why don't we have a Nike? And when I say that, I mean a fashion brand the size of Nike yeah. that yeah. was started from here. And what that means for the economy, what that means in terms of employment, Nike employs like 83,000 human beings. That changes the game for, wow. for economies. Yeah. Um, so these are some of the things that we are really passionate about when it comes to the work that we are doing. The final piece would be the fact that it allows us to create opportunities for women. Um, fashion does not have the barriers that other industries sometimes have when it comes to employment for women. If you have conversations with female Uber drivers, for example, some of the situations that they find themselves in they would never find themselves in in a fashion and business um, and so we are actively using the business to create opportunities for women when it comes to the way that we employ the impact projects that we we undertake 
Very interesting. What what really struck me is that you once worked in the financial industry, right? So that means it's not too late for me. I can also <laughs> identify an opportunity and it's move there. Too late. Very interesting. But you'd have to, to sacrifice your, your parts check for some time. Charlie, that, that would be the thing, <laughs> the bonuses and all that, Charlie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, so you've got me thinking. Um, Fashion is a $3 trillion business, is that what you say? Yes, global. Global. Wow. The African fashion industry is worth $1.2 billion. Wow. So it's no joke. It's no joke. It's yeah, no joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big potential. So this would make it, um, we're in 2024. So you've been at it for just Ten over years. a decade, right? Ten years. Ten years, exactly. Ten years. Wow. I'm sure it hasn't been a smooth sailing journey, right? No, so... no journey worth pursuing is ever smooth. But yeah, it's so, had its its challenges, but it's been a phenomenal journey of growth. Do you want to point out um, a few of your key challenges starting the business? I mean, where Ghana? I'm sure some people might have thought, are you going a bit, you know, trying to this this daring endeavor and all that? So. Tell me, um, in the course of the journey, maybe outline three key obstacles you faced and you know how you overcame them. I think in our particular case, I know people will start with funding, access to funding. Yeah. It was there. Um, it still is. Fidelity is solving a piece of that. Thank you very much. Um, but I'd say from the get-go, it was understanding who we were as co-founders because that's what dictates the kind of business we would build. We are Pan-African, so we will build a Pan-African business. I'm understanding our purpose here on Earth, and so the purpose of the business that we would build. And then once we had that understanding, knowing how to communicate that, and using that as the framework that we use to employ, the framework that we use in identifying who our true customers would be, who our true partners would be. And it's a journey, it doesn't happen overnight. It comes with a lot of introspection. We got a lot of things wrong. We lost a lot of employees down the line because there wasn't that fit. Um, and then access to coaching. At the end of the day, having people who have walked this journey, people who understand what it means to build a global business. Because from the get-go, that's what we said. We wanted to build a global business. We had zero idea what that meant and what we would need to evolve to become. Um, and so having access to business leaders who had walked that journey in the beginning was not an easy find. Um, but about a year down the line, we met um, Samuel Yebwa of Mripa Capital. And that changed a lot because now we had someone under whose guidance we could put some concrete targets uh, together to follow. Um, I'll say these from the start were some of our biggest challenges. Today, if you ask me what our biggest challenge is, it's in building a world-class team. We want to build a company that can sit very comfortably with Nike and be equals. Um, and it's a world-class team that builds a world-class business. No two ways around that. And being a small business with limited uh, um, funds to be able to attract world-class talent it takes a lot of creativity, it takes a lot of strategic um, planning, and that's what we are trying to crack right now. Um, and, and trying to change and intentionally craft a culture that allows us to deliver excellent results. It's unfortunate, but the work ethic in Ghana is horrible. <laughs> the average work ethic, like the average Ghanaian has horrible work ethic. Um, and so one has to be very, very intentional about creating a certain culture that allows people who come in expecting a certain way that work goes to then raise the again. bar. Yeah. Um, so for me, that currently is, is the biggest thing we are trying to solve because if you put the right people in each seat, they will work miracles. Okay, so your vision is global. Um, I'm just curious, uh, it's been 10 years. Um, I know obviously you've, you've established um, very solidly in Ghana, seeing as you have a global vision and you are Pan-African in mindset. I'm just curious, have you extended um, your tentacles elsewhere on the African continent yet? Do you have plans to? And um, secondly, um, after you talk about that, um, so you've kept talking about the fact that you're building a Pan-African business. I'm sure to some of um, 
uh, our viewers that might seem like one of those cliches you know so what exactly do you mean could you put that in context when you say pan-african business um, how exactly do you mean so let me start with that one we want to clothe africa we want to clothe people of african descent and everyone else who is interested in exploring culture through fashion um, and so today we ship our products to We've shipped to like five out of the six continents. We have customers around the world. Um, and yet we do not currently have a strong presence, as strong a presence as we have here in Ghana in the other countries. We are very interested in South Africa, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, Ni South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, Ivory Coast as the first four countries on the continent that we want to have a stronger presence as we do have here in Ghana. However, the Ghanaian economy has taught us a few lessons. <laughs> As a business, we've been fortunate by God's grace every year, even if it's marginal, our revenues have grown year on year. Great. And yet, from about three years ago, we started experiencing a situation where revenues were growing, net profits was, was, was going down, Absolutely. yes. And it's because although we are doing production here, most of the raw material is imported wow. directly or indirectly, and I'll explain. So we buy a lot of fabric from GTP. GTP does production here, but most of its raw material is, export, is imported. imported. The dyes, the calico, the machinery. Wow. Even the machines that, it's, it's such a pathetic thing, but even the needles that we used to sew are imported. imported. So what that means is every time there's a shaking of the CD, production costs just go up. <clears throat> and so as part of the plan to make our, 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 our finances stronger, this year, and we've been at it for some time, we're actively pursuing an international growth that's outside the continent as well. So we are really working at figuring out how do we crack the US market? How do we sell and earn some dollars? How do we sell in the UK market and earn some pounds and some euros so that when we grow, we preserve some of the value and be able, so that we are able to expand on the continent as well. Wow. wow. I know that we have been a part of your story, right? Fidelity Bank through our FYFDF um, initiative have been a part of your story. So briefly, um, I'd like you to tell us um, what um, your experience with FYF has been and how that has also been influential in shaping your business and its um, growth trajectory to the stage. I mean, I, I really need to commend Fidelity Bank for putting it like doing what they said that they would do. I, a lot of banks promise <laughs> very nice things, but don't <laughs> follow through. And my initial, uh, I had some reservations initially when I heard about the FYF, because we were into your customers. We were banking with some other banks and hearing the story of, oh, we can still get some funding um, uh, at very good interest rates from a bank that we do not have an account with was like, this is promising a lot. But it, Fidelity came through and so we accessed the loan. Um, the interest rate, I believe, was 10%. What that allowed us to do was to improve our inventory. So we invested all of that in inventory. Um, and, and so what that helps us to do is to take advantage, better advantage of existing demand and allows us the space also to go and create new demand. Because if we have limited funds, there's only so much production we can do. And so it was a situation of watching demand walking around and not being able to capture it. Yeah. Um, so now we are in a better place. We do need more funding. <laughs> Fidelity Bank, we need much more funding at even better rates. But what you've done for us has helped to improve um, our revenue space. Yeah. yeah, so if I may, um you were saying that you had some reservations because you were wondering why we would want to Not fund why you. you would want to, but if you would actually, if it would actually come do through. it because we didn't even have an account with Fidelity. Yeah. <clears throat> I think the why is clear. I think no bank in Ghana has any business being a bank if there's a question of why must we fund young entrepreneurs? Come on. How will your bank grow? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Entrepreneurs are, are, are creating the employment 
for like if you take SMEs, we hold the economy together. So I don't think it's a question of why. It's it's usually a question of the real desire to real. understand the businesses and de-risk so that you can lend. And I am I'm, I'm really grateful that Fidelity has done that. Not only with us, I've seen other programs that you have and some of my colleague entrepreneurs being beneficiaries. So well done, well done. Yeah, and I'd say the reason why we do that is because um, fundamentally we share the same DNA as mm -hmm. all other I mean, young um, businesses in Ghana do. Fidelity is also um, a Ghanaian business that started from scratch right here. We find that there's this notion uh, that people generally have about Ghanaian institutions or things that are made in Ghana. There's this notion that, well, if it's made in Ghana, it's probably mediocre and all that. But we at Fidelity have grown a global brand, uh, you know, a brand that is still growing, but continentally, globally, we have a name. And we stand for excellence. And we're trying to push that notion of Ghanaian excellence, that being Ghanaian doesn't always have to connote mediocrity or connote being below par. So I want to ask you, um, that is what we stand for, and that is the agenda we are pushing. Um, if I speak about Ghanaian excellence to you, what, what does that mean? Do you, first of all, agree to the concept of Ghanaian excellence? And how do you think that in your capacity as where Ghana, and even for other entrepreneurs, we can also begin to push that narrative, if you like, of Ghanaian excellence, of Ghanaianness and excellence in one phrase? I am completely aligned and I earlier talked about our mission as a company. It's to celebrate African excellence. The thing is, excellence is excellence. There isn't a certain, like Ghanaian excellence isn't here, then American excellence is here, then, you know, excellence is excellence. And I believe the reason we attach Ghanaian to excellence, it's it's often not found in the same place. And you talked about how products made here, yeah, uh, the, the perception, perception, exactly. Yeah. But you see, things don't just happen. Like we can't quite wash things. Um, and, and for me, it's why I am really excited about what you're doing here at Fidelity because you guys have been around for 26 years. You have been doing something right. You've been growing. That in itself, it's a showpiece, it's, it's evidence of Ghanaian excellence. And the more that we can have such examples, then we know that ah, we are actually an excellent people. So I don't believe in the quite washing of things. I believe in providing tangible evidence. And so I absolutely salute you and Fidelity Bank for 26 years of living, creating Ghanaian excellence and I salute every Ghanaian entrepreneur who has built a business that has stood the test of time. People like Esther Koba, who have been at it for like 30 years. I salute Captain Amwabin, whose story is interesting. But if you listen and see what it took to get to where they got to, that has to be saluted. If we have more of these examples, then when you say Ghanaian excellence, it's, it's the norm. I think the thing that we are all trying to do is to normalize excellence that comes from here. Because often, I, I like to ask people, when you're in the middle of a conversation and someone says, hey, Bibini, <laughs> are you flattered? Uh -huh. Or do you feel slighted? And in this, it's the truth of how we perceive ourselves. And so every day we show up and do excellent work, we are erasing some of the negative connotations and amplifying the fact that we can be excellent here. And for me, entrepreneurs are where I find a lot of my inspiration because it's quite the journey. Um, so yeah, I, I salute Fidelity Bank for, for standing, standing the test of time. Okay, and um, speaking about the whole spirit of excellence um, and what we are calling Ghanaian excellence, uh, I'd like you to, um, it's been an interesting conversation by the way, but I'd like you to say a final word in line with the, the whole agenda to promote Ghanaian excellence and to gradually alter that narrative of Ghanaianess meaning mediocrity. Um, what would you like to say to 
other entrepreneurs like yourself are coming and even beyond entrepreneurs i mean there are other young people who are in showbiz you know emerging um, showbiz personalities and uh, actors and music and all these other um, disciplines um, who intend to put ghana on the map uh, you know what would you say to them how do we together begin to change this narrative begin to showcase excellence such that in some time to come when you mention that you are from ghana it would automatically have that association with excellence what do you think we can all do to make this uh, this hope of ghanaian excellence becoming a thing a reality i think it starts from believing that it's even possible Right. If, if every day all we talk about is how one can never prosper here, one can never prosper here, then we won't even have this dream of contributing towards getting to the place where when you say made in Ghana, it's like made in Germany. It's like made in USA, yeah. right? Those are brands that have been built. And I mean, you are in comms, so you know, you can't sell, you can't sell a bad product for a long time. Yeah. At the end of the day, maybe you can have some short-term success, but time will, 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 will show that it's a bad product. And so it comes to the who we are part of it. And so this goes beyond, like you said, it goes beyond being an entrepreneur. It goes beyond, it comes down to who we are. And for me, I think it's in how we raise our children. There should be a very serious sense of urgency around this is the generation we are trying to create. Like, we know that we've been failed by past generations, but it's our turn to raise the next set of people who will run this country. And if we are intentional about making them, creating new proverbs that are the very opposite of Okafu Didi, Impa Bayi Bwambeye Nina, like having sayings that find their way into the who we are as a people, that that's one of the ways. And being intolerant of mediocrity, we, Ghanaians are very, very happy people. <clears throat> That's a good thing. It's a good thing. Happiness yeah. is what we are here to do. Like, what's the point if we won't be happy? So we have that. We are very happy people. But the flip side of it is that we tend to be very happy-go-lucky about things we should be upset about, things that we should say no to. And so if we are intentional about having those conversations of, that wasn't good enough, and saying it, and making it a, a norm of being able to tell there's a program that's been organized, being able to tell the organizer that wasn't good enough. If the world was watching, that's a disgrace to us. No, no offense, right? So we can be happy people, but still be intolerant of mediocrity. The reason that Made in Ghana products have the name that they have is that time told a certain story of the products that we're making. If we change that, time will tell a different story of, of what's being made here. Um, so yeah, let's, let's start calling truth out of us. Wow. So I think that's a very powerful note um, on which to unfortunately draw the curtains on what has been a very engaging discussion and I'm sure we could go on for <laughs> probably days. <laughs> but Irabna, thank you so much. Uh, it's been an interesting conversation and I like um, the way you ended it. Um, she says we should change our national mindset basically and we should intentionally raise the next generation of excellent Ghanaians. It does not happen by chance. We have to be intentional about it. And I would add that we don't have to wait for the next generation. Um, the young folk of today, we can decide now that we are going to change that narrative of excellence and work towards it and consciously apply a sense of agency to all that we do so that we can begin to put Ghana up there and Ghanaian excellence uh, will not only exist in Fidelity Bank or in Where Ghana, it will actually become a national brand. Thank you so much, Iravna. Thank you. Thank and um, I'm hoping we can have this conversation sometime later. I'm always available. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, off camera, we can talk about uh, my Where Ghana yes. outfits. Oh, why? All, what are <laughs> all right, it's been a pleasure coming your way. Um, we'll be back um, sometime later with more interesting conversations about Ghana, about banking, about excellence, and about so much more. And hopefully we'll have Iravna with us um, sometime later to have another very exciting conversation. My name is Esteban Mauto. It's been a pleasure um, having to chit-chat with her and with you. And we'll do this again sometime again. All right, bye.